Yeah, so I'd like to address the issue of the military industrial complex, the Israeli military industrial complex and its history uh, and what role it plays uh, in the Israeli occupation of Palestine, in the Israeli policy towards the Palestinians. The military industrial complex is a term that was coined by American President Eisenhower. Eisenhower gave this uh, very famous uh, speech in which he warned the voters uh, in the United States that uh, there is a very strong lobby group of the military industrial complex, the military companies, and they influence a uh, government decision in the United States. And uh, they have an inherent interest, an economic interest, that there will not be peace that the United States will continue to invest more and more money in a military buildup because this creates profits for these companies. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. Uh, and this concept has become very well known and very widely used, but we have to remember the United States context is a context of a country where all of the uh, weapon companies are privately owned. That means they, they function as companies, as, as corporations for profit. Uh, so when we talk about the Israeli military industrial complex, first thing that we uh, see is that that's not the case in Israel. Uh, in fact, uh, even today, the Israeli uh, largest military company called uh, Israeli Aerospace Industries, IAI, is government owned. Uh, and uh, out of the four largest weapon companies in Israel, three are government owned. So only number two uh, is, is privately owned. So if the companies are government owned, they don't exactly function like corporations. They don't exactly uh, attempt to maximize their profit at all costs like a, co a private company does. Can we even talk about a military industrial complex? What I want to uh, argue is that this is a gradual process that is happening in Israel. Uh, that the Israeli military industry has transformed itself dramatically uh, over the last 80 years. 80 years is a long time. The state of Israel exists only 70 uh, or 69 to be precise. Uh, but the Israeli military companies are much older. Uh, the oldest military company, it's called Israeli Military Industries, IMI. And it was uh, founded in the early 30s. But it wasn't really founded as a company. It wasn't founded... Uh, in an attempt to make a profit. It was founded as a factory to produce weapons for the Zionist militias operating in Palestine in order to arm them for national purposes, not for uh, economic purposes. Uh, and uh, when the state of Israel was founded, the government took ownership of that company, uh, of, of those factories, and uh, made it into a branch of the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Over the years, the various factories that were owned or, and operated by the Ministry of Defense have been transformed into government companies. Government companies means that it has the structure of a company. I mean, uh, there is a management, there are workers, uh, there's even uh, um, accounting reports about the profits and, and costs and, and so on. Uh, but it's 100% owned by the government. And... Uh, what we see more recently, especially since the 1990s, is that the government is trying to privatize those military industries. Privatizing them means to sell them to private investors. And when the company becomes owned by a private investor, then uh, the private investors actually try to make money with the company. They don't just try to support various, various national agendas. And then, of course, the company is starting to uh, um, become a little bit like the military industrial complex, trying to uh, profit from war, profit from conflict. Now, uh, there, the, although this is a topic that we don't know that much about because it's very secretive, all of these companies are uh, operating under a shroud of secrecy. The Ministry of Defense in Israel is the only ministry. Uh, in Israel that doesn't have to give a, a full breakdown of its budget uh, in the official government books. Uh, the companies are not uh, obligated to publish their financial reports. They publish only partial financial reports and not every year. Um, and, the, and the workers working in these companies are obligated to keep secrecy. They're not allowed to say what kind of systems they're developing. 
And uh, so that makes it a little bit restrictive for us to try to understand how the system works. On the other hand, uh, it's not such a big country. Israel, uh, uh, the population is not very big. Uh, and uh, the people working in these factories are part of Israeli society. Some information gets leaked to the press, and sometimes the government or senior government uh, uh, officials find it in the interest of the Israeli government to allow some of that information to be published. What I find especially interesting is that the best source of information about the companies is what the companies themselves publish. And especially not the government owned, but the privately owned companies, because they uh, like to, to issue press releases. We just made a great deal with this country selling this kind of technology and so on. Uh, and they do that in order to attract investors. And sometimes they also um, present their technologies in fairs, in weapon fairs, to show what kind of technologies they have. And this, uh, of course, is, is another way for us to learn a little bit what these companies do, what kind of technology interests them, and for what purpose. Um, so that gives us a, a window into the Israeli military industry. And through this window, I think we can see how this kind of military industrial complex is emerging. But I'm already going to say, although it is emerging, it has never reached a point where the military industrial complex in Israel was able to really um, decide government policy. It came close a, in, in a few times, but uh, never as close as it has in the case of the United States. There's a big difference. Okay, so if we go a little bit chronologically how this uh, industry developed, uh, I already said it started with these factories uh, providing weapons for the Israeli militias, then for the Israeli military. And uh, this became a branch of the Ministry of Defense. People dedicated their lives to developing weapons for the Israeli military. And uh, at that time, uh, the purpose was very ideological and very nationalistic uh, to make sure that the Israeli military keeps its quality edge over the neighboring Arab armies, uh, and for that purpose, developing various kinds of weapons. Uh, and these uh, industries also realize that uh, the budget that they receive from the Ministry of Defense is never enough. They always need more money. Uh, and so they decided that they're going to produce a little bit more than what they need in order to export some of those weapons in order to make some money that they can use for research. So here we see uh, a period, and, and I'm talking now about mainly the 1950s and early 1960s, where the weapons, uh, the, the export, the military export from Israel was mainly intended not to create profit to make people rich, although of course some people become, became rich, but uh, uh, on the on the whole, it was uh, with the purpose of uh, uh, funding the research of more advanced weapons. But in that time, uh, the Israeli government had two different opinions about what is the best way to manage this kind of industry. And, and two schools of thoughts emerged. One school of thought was headed by a, a general uh, called Yitzhak Rabin. Yitzhak Rabin later became the prime minister of Israel and he was assassinated in 1995. So he's quite a famous uh, person. And Yitzhak Rabin uh, and this school of thought, they believed that uh, um, the Israeli military industry has to specialize, has to develop very specific technologies in which they have the advantage and focus on them. Uh, so, for example, develop the best missiles and the best uh, drones, or back then there were no drones, but, uh, but there were some technologies that the Israeli industry was more uh, known for, such as submachine guns, but uh, not try to imitate the uh, technology of other countries. Instead, let's import from other countries what we need. So. Let's not build our own tanks. Let's buy um, uh, tanks from the United States or from Britain, um, uh, but but develop our own submachine guns and then export them in order to to specialize in what we do best. The second school of thought was the self-sufficiency school of thought, and it was headed by a very senior member of the Ministry of Defense and later Minister of Defense and later also Prime Minister of Israel, Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres. Um, 
also a very famous Israeli politician. And he had a completely different view, even though they came from the same political party. He said, no, we have to, we cannot rely on international support. We cannot rely on our ability to import. We need to develop, to produce everything that we need for ourselves. That means the Israeli army, the Israeli arms industry has to make tanks and ships and airplanes, everything and ammunition. So they, they had a big uh, argument amongst themselves and each project that was proposed by the military industry was then debated by these two schools of thought. All of this leads up to the war of 1967 when uh, the Israeli military conquers a vast territory. Uh, of course, the most uh, famous territory is the Palestinian territory, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. That includes, of course, East Jerusalem. But people also tend to forget that a chunk of territory was conquered from uh, Syria, the Golan Heights. And a very large uh, uh, chunk of territory was conquered from Egypt, uh, the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, but that was later returned to Egypt. So actually, uh, the size of Israel increased by 40 percent in that war. Uh, and uh, there was immediate international pressure on Israel to uh, sign a peace treaty with its neighbors and withdraw from the occupied territory. The Israeli government decided it's not going to do that, at least not in the immediate time. And then these two schools of thought, the uh, specialization school of thought and the self-sufficiency school of thought, had a very heated debate what's going to ha happen next. Because the biggest supplier of weapons to Israel until 1967 was France. And France, which was then under the leadership of President de Gaulle, said, uh, wanted to keep good relations with Arab countries and said, uh, if Israel is not going to withdraw from the occupied territory, France is going to impose a military embargo on Israel and stop selling weapons to Israel. So the Israeli government then decided to go with the school of self-sufficiency, the one of Shimon Peres. We cannot rely on imports. Because of the occupation, we have to build everything ourselves. And then the Israeli uh, arms industry exploded in size with massive government inv uh, uh, investment. Uh, they started to have um, so, uh, production lines to build tanks and warships and helicopters and planes and artillery and rifles and ammunition and missiles and everything. Uh, and this sort of investment uh, was something that the Israeli economy was not really able to, to manage. Uh, the industry, it, it completely transformed the Israeli industrial force, uh, turning the military industry into a, a giant part of the Israeli industry altogether. And it was also something that technologically the Israeli arms industry was simply not capable of doing. And, and uh, most of these projects just failed. Uh, the tanks and the planes and ships that were produced by, the, uh, by these uh, companies were not really up to international standard. Um, but then uh, something happened that uh, changed everything again. The, another war came in 1973, uh, which took the Israeli side completely by surprise, even though it was rather uh, logical that the Arab countries will not just accept their defeat and, and uh, not try to regain the territory that they lost. So in 1973, Syria and Egypt launched an invasion uh, into Israel, uh, trying to regain the lost territory. Uh, and the Israeli army was caught unaware, unprepared and ill-equipped. Their equipment was simply not uh, good enough. Uh, compared to the equipment uh, of the Syrian and Egyptian army armies, which were supplied by the Soviet Union. They had Soviet uh, um, equipment, Soviet tanks and uh, airplanes and guns. And uh, that uh, means that this war that lasted only a couple of weeks uh, made w was a moment in which the Israeli government was not even sure that they're going to win. Uh, it wasn't very sure how, how this war is going to end. In the middle of that war, the United States makes a dramatic decision that they are going to take the side of Israel and not the side of the Arab countries. In a very clear decision, the United States starts sending military aid to the Israeli side. This military aid, uh, we're, maybe we're going to talk later about how exactly uh, 
uh, the United States came to that decision for what purpose. But from the Israeli side, this changed everything because in the middle of the of the fighting, the soldiers got better rifles, better by a very important <laughs> significant factor uh, compared to their Israeli manufactured rifles, and that turned the tide of the war. And when the war was over, the United States continued uh, to provide military aid to Israel. And the schools of thought, the two schools of thought of the military industry, that was the end of the debate because the self-sufficiency school has completely lost. Uh, the United States w did not allow the self-sufficiency school to continue. From their point of view, if Israel is trying to produce their own airplanes, well, they're just competing with the US technology and that's not acceptable. So Israel is only allowed to specialize in their own technology. Uh, and that specialization school then became uh, the, the dominant school and it remains until today. Over the last years, we've seen several attempts by the Israeli government and the military industries to develop various weapon projects that they thought would be a, a profitable, useful, important for the Israeli military needs for whatever reason. But every time that this technology competed with a similar technology from the United States, the Pentagon intervened and the United States represented very faithfully the interests of the privately owned U.S. arms industry. So even though it's privately owned, the government of the United States doesn't see it like that. They consider it to be their own interests and uh, they uh, clamped down and prevented the Israeli arms industry from producing the same uh, uh, technology. And they did it with a very uh, complex array of mechanisms, for example, by uh, forcing the Israeli government to accept as part of the uh, aid, the, the military aid, certain objects that were exactly what the Israeli arms uh, technology was trying to develop. So the Israeli Ministry of Defense said, well, okay, we have anti-tank missiles now from the United States, more than we can ever need. There is absolutely no need for us to try to develop our own. And the project to develop anti-tank tank missiles was cancelled. The most famous ca uh, project was the Israeli uh, uh, aerospace industries, IAI, that I mentioned before, tried to develop an attack plane, a, a, a fighter plane, which they called the LAVI. It was supposed to be better than the F-16, uh, more maneuverable and uh, more advanced in its technology. And of course, the United States was not too happy about that. And after the Israeli government invested billions and really a great deal of effort in trying to develop this project. In the end, they realized they're just not going to be allowed to do it. So they, they had to stop in the middle, fire thousands of workers. And it was um, considered a, a great embarrassment that this project was canceled in the, in, in the end. Um, but but I think it also shows us a little bit what are the restrictions uh, under which the Israeli arms industry is operating. They're not all powerful. but. These lessons, these harsh lessons, taught the Israeli arms industry what their limitations are and taught them how they need to uh, develop uh, their technology in a way that doesn't clash with U.S. interests. Elbit Systems is today the second biggest arms company in Israel. Actually, um, it might be the biggest arms company in Israel because IAI, which is government-owned, also has a non-military department. So if we don't include the non-military department of IAI, then maybe Elbit is actually bigger than IAI in terms of arms production, but that's not so important. What is important is that Elbit Systems has fully understood what they can and cannot do as an Israeli arms company. And what they do, for example, uh, is produce helmets for pilots. And uh, these are special, uh, highly advanced helmets that have display um, systems within the co uh, within the helmet that allows the pilot to see uh, on their visor uh, targets and and that uh, and various information and the helmets are designed to interface with American made helicopters and planes. So if you buy a, a, an F-16 from the United States, it makes sense to also buy the helmet from Elbit Systems. If you buy a, an Apache helicopter, also you can get the corresponding helmet from Elbit Systems. That means that now they work in symbiosis, not in competition. Uh, 